Bonsoir, good evening. What an atmosphere. Oh, I'm very honored to be the commencement speaker at Sciences Po, which I must say is a school that I've long admired. And to take part in a graduating ceremony is a wonderful opportunity to reflect on what you have learned and benefited from as master students. I saw masters in human rights and humanitarian affairs um, just been graduating, and to bask in your achievements. And it's also a wonderful time for your parents and all your family who are here, uh, relatives and friends, to join in celebrating with you. Normally, um, you know, I was chancellor of my own university, Trinity College in Dublin, for 21 years. I've just retired. And I remember all these graduating ceremonies, and they're all very happy, upbeat occasions. And that's the normal. That's what normally happens. But times are not so normal anymore. The world into which you graduate is a fraught and fractured one with many problems, one of which I want to highlight, which is the existential threat of climate change. I actually don't think I need to emphasize that because Paris and France is having um, extreme heat. I got a record heat. I felt it today when I landed in Paris. Being an Irish person with my Irish skin, I don't like this very intense heat. It's not so bad in this hall, but you know, outside it's very hot at the moment. And uh, we know that this is not an accident, that this has been accumulating, that this is what we call global warming, climate change. But this, to me, is the ideal university in which to share my own thoughts about how what I call climate justice can help secure a good future for all. I'm greatly encouraged by the fact that I recently attended the first World Forum on Climate Justice it was at Glasgow Caledonian University, and there were over 180 participants from 35 countries. I say that because when I started my foundation more than 10 years ago, the words climate justice were kind of taboo. Nobody knew what this meant, and you know, they were kind of worried about it being too radical, too difficult. Was it blaming people? What, what, what was it about? And so to have a world forum was really important. And we've re reflected together on the importance of having a people-centered, human rights and gender responsive approach to the climate crisis, linking people with the ecosystems, the animals, all the species that share this world with us and that we also have to be responsible for. Let's go back to 2015 not so long ago. The frameworks negotiated by member states of the United Nations in that year, the 30, 2030 framework, the 2030 agenda, with its 17 sustainable development goals, and the Paris Climate Agreement, were voluntary or weak in enforceability. As you heard, I was the special envoy of the Secretary General. I was observing this. Um, countries were able to agree because they could pick and choose how they would implement. That was basically it. They could choose what they would do. So they agreed. 193 countries agreed the 2030 agenda in September. 195 countries agreed the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. However, the goal in the Paris Climate Agreement was that we would stay well below two degrees Celsius of warming above pre-industrial standards and we would work towards 1.5 degrees. And I must say, as the UN Secretary General Special Envoy in Paris, I thought that was just for the small island states, you know, a concession to them, because they pleaded so hard, 1.5 to stay alive. It was a mantra at Paris. But the scientists had never studied this. So when they were asked by the Paris Climate Agreement, what's the difference 
between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. And if we have to stay at 1.5 degrees, what does it mean and how do we do it? And that was the, they were the two questions that the scientists answered. And the answer they gave about the 1.5 degrees and the 2 degrees was really quite serious. It's in that period that really serious things happen to our world. By and large, the coral reefs disappear. By and large, the Arctic ice disappears. And then there will be a permafrost melting, which sends up not just carbon greenhouse gas, but methane in serious, and then methane is much, much more serious than carbon. So in that period, very, very serious things happen, and that's before we get to two degrees. So what the scientists said was, no, this isn't for the small island states. This is for the whole world. It is much safer for our children and grandchildren that we stay at 1.5 degrees. And since then, as I'm sure you will recall, we had another report in May about the extinction of species, about a million species being extinguished because of the impact that our fossil fuel world has made on those species. And as a con uh, consequence, I believe that we can no longer afford to regard those two big frameworks, the 2030 Agenda in September 2015 and the Paris Climate Agreement in December uh, of 2015. We can no longer regard them as voluntary, as pick and choose, as take it or leave it, more or less. And these are instead imperative because of the science. Um, I've taken on a new scientific hat. I think it's a hat that my dear elder friend, Lakhtar Brahimi, is very well known to you here in Sciences Po. Um, yes, a little clap for Lakhtar. I don't think Lakhtar realizes that I have another hat. Um, I'm now one of the two patrons of the World Science Body, the Inter in in International Science Council, which brings together two previous bodies. One was the International Science Council, and the other was the International Social Science Council. And they've come together as one body last year, and they want to promote both the science and the human dimensions, the humanity of science um, in one body. So they've chosen um, patrons to help to do that, and I happen to be one of those um, patrons. And um, it's for that that I actually can say with even more confidence, confidence that science has now made it imperative that we secure a livable world for our children and grandchildren by fully implementing both the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement. And this requires a change of mindset um, a change of mindset at the global political level. Because in explaining what we need to do to stay at 1.5 degrees, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said, we have to reduce by 45% carbon emissions by 2030 from 2010 standards. Reduce by 45%, but you know what happened last year? Carbon emissions went up. So we're not reducing at the moment. They actually went up and we have to change and have a very different mindset. But the scientists also said, this is doable if you have the political will. And how do you get that political will and that sense of global solidarity? I believe that it's through the emerging movement of climate justice, putting pressure on governments and on business, particularly the fossil fuel industry. And it's heartening to see that school children are striking, that young people are making their voices heard. We have women leaders, leaders stepping up very strongly. Some, such as Extinction Rebellion, have taken to peaceful protest. And there's an increasing business commitment and investment leadership telling us we need more ambition from governments. And as I mentioned, the scientists also are on board. The importance of this growing climate justice movement is that it will call for a just transition to a world powered by clean energy and climate actions that fully respect 
human rights, and gender equality. So workers in coal, oil, and gas won't be left out. And the Gio Jaune won't be left out. They will also be included. And priority will also be given to reaching the one, point, the one billion people in our world today of 7.7 .7 billion who never switched the switch for electricity. Imagine that. One billion people out of 7.7 .7 billion never switch the switch. They light their homes with kerosene and candles, both of which are, 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 are dangerous. And the 2.3 billion who still cook on coal and animal dung and wood and in, inhale smoke indoors that kills so many of them and the children um, who are with them. We have the off-grid lights, we have the mini systems, and we have the clean cook stoves that can transform the lives of a significant portion of our world and enable them to take themselves out of deep poverty. So rising to the challenge of addressing the threat of climate change can be truly transformative and achieve the commitment in the 2030 agenda to leave no one behind. So what's required is that people from all walks of life commit to taking three steps. And this is what I'm asking you to do at your graduation ceremony and your parents and family and friends who are with you and listening, just three steps. And the first step is to make the issue of climate change personal in your lives. Do something that gives you ownership of this issue as a person. And it's something that is relevant to reducing your own pr climate imprint, changing your diet habits perhaps. For example, I've become a pescatarian, a word I didn't even use until recently. It means I don't eat meat, basically. And, you know, I loved lamb from the west of Ireland. It cost me a little bit, but it means, you know, you take ownership. And then the second step is to get angry and get active. Get angry with those who have more power and therefore more responsibility, such as governments at all levels, um, at all levels, including the city level, cities and towns. Get angry with business, especially fossil fuel business, agribusiness and transport. And then the second part of the second step is take action by using your voice and your vote and by supporting organizations involved in conservation issues or climate change advocacy, which can also actually help to reduce your own climate anxiety. Those of you who are feeling a climate anxiety in the world you're graduating into, it helps to be active. And thirdly, the third step, I believe is the most important of all. And it's the one we don't talk about enough. It's most important that we imagine this world that we must be hurrying towards. Not think of it as, oh my goodness, it's going to be terrible. I have to give up this, I have to give up that. No, it's going to be a much healthier world. It's going to be an air, a world without the air and water pollution of fossil fuel. And it has to be a more equal world because everyone will have access to clean energy. And to get there, we will have had to show the very solidarity called for in the 2030 agenda with its sustainable development goals. So it'll be a world of deeper human relationships at all levels. It'll also be a world of a circular economy, consuming less and valuing more. We need a climate justice movement, speaking up for people who've had the least capacity to protect themselves, their families, their homes, and their incomes from the impacts of climate change, and indeed climate action policies that are not grounded in human rights. Just think of the terrible devastation caused by Cyclone Ida in some of the poorest countries in Africa recently, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. In this case, climate change is not only a destructive force in its own right, it also serves to amplify and to aggravate existing inequalities as those with the least resources suffer the greatest hardships. Climate change respects no borders and it affects all countries regardless of income level. As witnessed by devastating floods across Europe in recent years, the heat that European countries, notably France, are suffering at the moment, or the cyclones and hurricanes that have battered the coast of the United States. At its heart, climate justice is a transformative concept. It insists on a shift from a discourse on greenhouse gases and melting ice caps into a civil rights movement 
with the people and communities most vulnerable to climate impacts at its very heart. Now, thanks to the recent marches, strikes and protests of hundreds and thousands of schoolchildren, we've begun to understand the intergenerational injustice of climate change and the need to plan transition policy over a time span to include many generations to follow, including those yet unborn. Let me conclude by telling you of an experience I had very recently. Two weeks ago, I was privileged to attend the second dialogue at the Vatican on energy transition and care of our common home, which included executives from the world's leading oil and gas producers and also global investors and, and some scholars of climate science and high-level representatives of the academic world. In his address to the group, Pope Francis said, and I'd like to quote him at a little length because it's so relevant. He said, your meeting has focused on three interrelated points. First, just transition. Second, carbon pricing. And third, transparency in reporting climate risk. These are three immensely complex issues, and I commend you for taking them up. A just transition, as you know, is called for in the preamble of the Paris Agreement. Such a transition involves managing a social and employment impact of the move to a low carbon society. If managed well, this transition can generate new jobs, reduce inequality, and improve the quality of life for those affected by climate change. Second, carbon pricing is essential if humanity is to use the resources of creation wisely. The failure to deal with carbon emissions has incurred a vast debt that will now have to be paid, repaid with interest by those coming after us. Our use of the world's natural resources can only be considered ethical when the economic and social costs of using them are transparently recognized and are fully borne by those who incur them rather than by other people or future generations. The third issue, transparency in reporting climate risk, is essential because economic resources must be deployed where they can do the most good. Open, transparent, science-based and standardized reporting is in the common interests of all. Enabling financial capital to move to those areas that support the fullest possible, um, possibilities to human ingenuity to create and innovate, while at the same time protecting the environment and creating more sources of employment. End of the quote from Pope Francis. The Pope's leadership for care for our common home reminds us that faith groups must also be part of the growing climate justice movement. So I want to challenge you, the graduates today, the 2019 graduates, um, to basically become leaders of this climate justice. This is your world. This is the window you have, and it's short to really make a difference. It's a big challenge, but remember the wise words of Nelson Mandela. He made Lactor Brahimi and myself his elders, and therefore we reference him a lot. And he said something very simple. He said, it always seems impossible until it's done. So enjoy your special day. Have all the excitement, have all the fun, but then get serious. Thank you.